There were, of course, other questions, and all speaking at once, the children asked him to explain his project and why he needed children and what sort of danger they were in. Mr. Benedict set down his teacup. Very well, I shall explain everything, and you may listen as you eat your breakfast. When he began, however, Constance was the only child who continued to eat. The others were unable to concentrate on anything besides his explanation. Several years ago, Mr. Benedict said, in the course of my research on the human brain, it came to my attention that messages were being delivered to people all across the world. Delivered, I should say. Quite without their knowledge. It is as if I secretly hid a letter in your pocket, and later you found it and read it, not knowing where it came from. In this case, however, the messages were going directly into people's minds, which absorbed them, not only without knowing where the messages came from, but without realizing they had received or read anything at all. The messages appear to be in a kind of code, Mr. Benedict continued. They come across like poetic gibberish, but from early on I've had reason to believe they're having a powerful effect, a most unfortunate effect, on those who receive them, which is to say almost everyone. In fact, I believe these messages are the source of the phenomenon commonly known as the emergency. Though I admit, I don't know how, I don't know to what end. And so I have devoted myself to discovering their ultimate purpose and who it is that sends them. Unfortunately, I've not entirely succeeded. But you've learned a great deal, protested number two. Certainly I have. I know, for instance, how the messages are being delivered. And where they're sent from, Rhonda said impatiently. And what the sender is capable of doing, cried number two. Obviously, Rhonda and number two were worried the children might misjudge Mr. Benedict. Sensing this, he gave an appreciative smile. Yes, my friends, it's true. We do know some things. For instance, we know the sender uses children to deliver the hidden messages. Children, Sticky said. Why children? And what exactly do the messages say? Rainy asked. When you are quite finished with your breakfasts, I'll show you. In the meantime, let me tell you. Please, can't wait. Breakfast, wait. Kate interrupted. Let us see right now. Well, if you all feel this way, said Mr. Benedict, noticing the looks of impatience. This time, not even Constance resisted, perhaps because she was already full. And so the children were taken straight away up to the third floor, down a long, narrow hallway, and at last into a room packed with equipment. You can obviously tell the lights in the classroom have gone up because I've not been moving. Huh. Hold on, I'm back. I don't know if that was better or not, but <laughs> here we go. Um, long, narrow hallway, and at last into a room packed with equipment. It was a terrific mess. On a table against the wall sat a television, a radio, a computer, and upon every other available service, surface were scattered countless tools, wires, books, and charts, and notebooks and disconnected antennas, disassembled gadgets, and various other unrecognizable oddments. There was hardly anywhere to step as Mr. Benedict, closely attended by Rhonda number two, led them over to the television. Listen carefully, Mr. Benedict said, turning on the television. Instantly, Rainey felt his skin crawl. It was a familiar feeling, he realized, but he had never paid it much attention before. Meanwhile, a news program had appeared on the screen. A red-haired reporter with shiny gold earrings stood outside the White House where a crowd of people had gathered, as usual, to wave signs and demand something be done about the emergency. They're calling for change, said the reporter, her features gathered in an expression of thoughtful seriousness, and their cries are not falling on deaf ears. The president has repeated his agreement with something must be done, and soon. Meanwhile, in the halls of the Congress, Constance gave a loud yawn. I don't hear anything unusual. The other children looked at Mr. Benedict. It was rude of Constance to say it that way, but she was right. Mr. Benedict nodded. Now pay attention, please. Number two, engage the receiver. Number two sat at the computer with a wink, with a quick, sorry, agile fingers, typed a string of commands. The television screen flickered. Its picture grew distorted. The children could still make out the wavery image of the news reporter gesturing towards the crowd behind her, but her voice faded away 
replaced by that of a child. What in the world? Kate said. Just listen, said number two. The unseen child, it sounded like a girl about Kate's age, spoke in a plodding, whispery monotone, her voice half drowned in static. At first, only a few random words were clear enough to be understood. Market, too free to be obfuscate. Number two typed more commands into the computer. The interference lessened considerably, and the child's words came clearly now, slipping through the faint static in a low drone. The missing aren't missing, they're only departed. All minds keep all thoughts, so like gold, closely guarded. Again, the words were overcome by static. Number two muttered under her breath, her fingers flew across the keyboard, and the child's slow, whispery voice returned. Grow the lawn and mow the lawn. Always leave the TV on. Brush your teeth and kill the germs. Poison apples, poison worms. It went on like this. The child's voice never faltered, never ceased, but delivered the curious phrases in an eerie chant-like progression. The news reporter, meanwhile, had vanished from the distorted picture.